I think it's safe to say if I didn't tell people about my past, except for the occasional tick, you know, they, they wouldn't know. There was a real disconnect between the steady hand of the previous culture and the new hippie movement. It blew up around with the idea of uh, communes, Eastern mysticism coming in through yoga, pushed through the Beatles, Alice Crowley, pop culture, on and on it went. And so I made a perfect spiritual environment where people began rejecting, I guess you'd call the mainstream religion, and looking to the new age. Tread the path of attainment, you must go to the one who successfully passed them. It is possible to make contact with the secret source of life, the most high. Those who are devoted to me, they are united with me. Those who are not devoted, they don't know me. Thy last supper, I did not betray the Son of God, nor did I betray his secrets to thy enemies, nor do I give him a kiss of Judas. I pray to thee, O Lord, hallowed by thy name, remember me as I enter thy glorious kingdom. For the spirit of man is blind and dumb, except God touch him and awake. In the winter of his flesh, the spring of his immortality. Growing up, did you think there was anything strange about the environment you lived in? For a long time, no. It was all I ever knew. And I think any child like that, you just live with life around you. You learn to interact, learn to go, but time passed on. And as we went into high school, began to read books, um, even I think a TV arrived and we began to see some movies very controlled. We began to see some stuff and we got an inkling probably around the time when I would have been around eight, nine, I'm thinking back. So we're now talking very early 80s, uh, began to realise this wasn't normal. And so that's where the phone and the lounge room was. So Dad, what did you listen to? The aunts working out who had actually taken things. The rule book when they were going to search for us. Ah, uh, so you so guys found out where to hide and... Where to hide and what was going on, yeah. here running on the footsteps and assume that the ants are running down to try and catch us. So we immediately shove the cards under the bed and assume the proper position and this stream of people start coming in. I was like, what the heck? This this isn't the answer, what's going on? So immediate mayhem. Um, and it's really difficult to remember blow by blow what happened during that initial period. My next memory has been at the top of the stairs, clinging on, not wanting to go and the police officer encouraging me to leave and then eventually deciding to leave, getting into the bus that they bought with all the other kids. By that stage, Sarah, Leanne and Antoinette were both all there in the bus to calm us, give us a bit of continuity. And then I'm lying in bed thinking through about 7.30 Friday night, all the things I'd said, checking off what I should and shouldn't say, if I get into trouble or not, because that had happened many times before. And then realizing this epiphanal moment that probably matched the words I spoke when we were driven away. God's, you know, a, a, the idea that a, a page has turned, a new chapter is being written. So here I am now, hours later, lying in bed, realizing I don't have to do this anymore. I'm actually free. That was quite a profound moment of realizing the prison doors have opened. I'm free. And I think I settled my mind then, I'm not coming back. Whatever I've got to do. was larger than life. Um, yeah, 
very confident in who he was, very warm, very kind, his wife as well, so I got on very well with him. There were allegations made that, you know, Paul was inappropriate with some of the older girls, and look, I don't know, not there, didn't see it, but that was allegations given. My life fell apart, I, I came unglued. It was it was the final straw for me. I was struggling anyway, living with the kids I'd grown up with, to be honest, yeah. uh, just the dynamics. I, I had grown up really, this, the class snitch, didn't trust me, didn't like me, and I, they had good reason. Yeah. So it just the environment for me was just unhealthy. So I had a social worker, um, and I, you know, I remember just saying to her, listen, you've got to get me a foster mother, I'm, this is it. I definitely made it very clear I was never coming back. So what was school like for you during this period? So the nickname was Psycho, no good reason for <laughs> that. Um, I had no social skills. Um, I had no interest in forming relationships with people my own age and no connection. I didn't know what the rules were, how to function. Yeah. Some of the boys made it their U11 English project to try and socialise me. Oh, really? Yeah. They were very kind. How did that go? I started learning things like if you're going to wear your school bag, it's over the left hand shoulder. Cool, you don't you know, don't do this. They at least try to fix the outwards, and then they were kind enough to allow me to interact with them a bit and connect and looked out for me and let me become part of the friendship group. They did their best and they were just kind hearted, which you realise in life a lot of people are kind hearted. They're not looking to be cruel or mean. So we took a trip around Central Australia, um, I would have been year eleven. I went with some friends and came back with no one. Um, not their fault, I was just awkward, messed up. You know, unable to, as I said, connect and relate to people, always competing, always trying to be better than everyone else, snitching on them if they did wrong, which they did. But all of that, I was just, it was horrendous. So very much struggled. Uh, and I said, I got to, you know, I was in year 11 repeating and just, I was suicidal. Yes, I didn't have answers and I knew it. I came back from that trip. I remember saying, I don't know how, I'm, but I'm gonna learn how to swim. It's got to be an answer at the moment I'm thinking. I'm going to find out what the answers to life are and I'm not going to fail. Came to a place where I'm in the Blackburn Baptist pastor's office, the youth pastor's office praying. My eyes are shut, I'm totally awake, but I have a vision being played in front of my eyes. I'm standing on the edge of this cliff and I know I have to jump. I've got to trust God to help get me out of the situation I'm in and I'm struggling to do this. Every time I try and do it, it ended up turning into a hill and I'm running down it. And eventually I come to this place where I say, you know what, I just have to trust you, God. And Jesus Christ catches me and picks me up, puts my head against his chest as I'm sitting on his knee. I'm a child. Puts my head against his chest and said to me, I never meant it to be. That was extremely difficult theologically for me. Jesus Christ is Anne Hamilton Byrne who abused me destroyed my life and then to see him in this vision you know, picking me up, putting my head against his chest and said to me, I never meant it to be. So I, you know, as, as I said, I, I was looking for how do, you, how do you start again? I mean, it's been a, a journey, it's been a process. It wasn't like a f switch got flicked and said, oh, I'm the new improved individual. So over the decades, Christ has made me whole to the point where having had a family stripped away from me, uh, my parents, to have that given back. I got married at 20, um, gone on and had uh, stayed married about to uh, 30 year anniversaries in September, a 23 year old daughter who's married, um, Ellie and my son, 21, about to turn 21, I turned 50. It's, it's pretty cool, life's been very good. Uh, my name is Ellie Macasello and Ben is my father. Um, I guess it was kind of always known, like he would always know that my dad had a weird childhood, um, grew up with a weird lady who told him lies. Yeah, it was, yeah, but I didn't explicitly know everything. You know, as I got older, more stuff was revealed to me over time. So I remember my dad talking about 
um, someone asked him, like, have you forgiven these people? He goes, yeah. Like, in prayer, he literally was like, I forgive Anne Hamilton Byrne for lying to me, telling, you know, doing X, Y, Z. I forgive this auntie for, you know, hitting me when she got angry. Just forgave everyone. So his perspective on, on them has changed. Yeah. Even his mum. I know over time that relationship has changed. When he first met her, she didn't want to admit what she'd done has, was wrong. Until I think this year, she actually said, yeah, what I did was wrong. And I remember my dad being like, like just like it almost like a weight lifted off him. I remember saying to him like, that would have been really nice to hear that. You know, even though he'd already forgiven her, but just someone admitting, yeah, what I did to you sucked. Yeah. What do you consider the driving purpose in your life now? Um, to help others, you know, I, I, while I grew up in a, a cult, in essence, it was broken family. It was living with harsh, violent authority. You know, so a lot of those underlying problems that are, that people have in life, I realize I had the same, just a bit more sensational, but the same issues, the same problems. So there's a desire to be able to help people and provide answers and do what I can to teach, mentor, care, you know, do what's needed to bridge that gap and provide the help required for people that are willing and desires to hear it and, and provide answers for why things happen.